Good morning. Everybody, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, right, at the back, cool, awesome. So, um, yeah, welcome to my talk today on a modern employment workflows for education. My name is Ben Toms, I'm technical director at DataJar. Uh, you might also know me as MacMule. Um, that's my Slack handle there, my blog, my Twitter feed, etc. Now, how can I talk about uh, modern workflows for education when I come from a business? Well, at DataJar, our thing is we're Apple device management specialists. We don't care about your firewall until it gets in our way. But we're not going to manage that for you. We're going to help you with your Apple devices. And we help people in different ways. So first of all, we've got folks who are self-managed. This is where maybe we resell them a product, maybe offer some training, but those folks run with it. Um, other times, we fully manage the Apple solution. We are the Apple team for people. And lastly, there's a hybrid where we work with people on this. What this means, though, for this talk is that we're dog fooding. If we look at the percentage of customers we have, we've got roughly 50-50 between education and business, or something like 52% is education. So the stuff I'm talking about today is stuff that we are doing, and is stuff that we're integrating. So despite the fact that we're not an education, uh, educational institute ourselves, we are working with a number of them, a number of, of, of colleagues yourself. In fact, some of our customers are sitting right here as well. So I feel like we, 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 we can talk about this. Now, when we look at the modern deployment methods uh, nowadays for education, there's been two, two key areas we're gonna focus on. One is Apple School Manager, and the next thing we'd look at the devices, the workflows, the things that you can do from Apple School Manager and apply them. What's gonna be key in here in the middle is your MDM. Now, I'm not gonna to talk too much about MDM, um, and I'm not, and it, but if I do talk about MDM, generally I'm gonna be talking from Jamf, because that's the, the, the product that I know. Um, however, MDM is gonna be key to this, but you need to do the Apple School Manager part first, and you also obviously need the devices. If you're looking at doing a summer deployment, there's so much that you need to do in advance before you bring the MDM in, and this is where we start with the Apple School Manager side of things. So, Apple School Manager. Apple School Manager's been around since uh, August 2016, roughly, uh, and it, I think it was, came out of beta when iOS 9.3 was released. So it's been around for, for a while now. If you're not enrolled into any Apple deployment programs, you can click on the Enroll Now button at the bottom, which is obscure, but just down there, right at the bottom. And from here, you need to enter in some details, first of all, to do the enroll. Now, the person who's doing the enrollment, this could be yourselves, but it can't be a generic account. You can't enter in details here saying iPad coordinator or Apple school manager enrollment. It has to be an actual legitimate person's name. Apple will push this back otherwise. The second part of this as well is your verification contact. So this needs to be someone who, for your institute, is legally allowed to, to, to kind of sign off terms and conditions with Apple. The reason this kind of stuff's important, if you try and do this in summer, and potentially the legal representatives of your organization are on holiday, we've certainly had it at times where we're trying to get hold of someone who's in their own villa in the south of France. It doesn't really work, as you can imagine. So do this stuff now in advance of your bringing on an MDM. And this process as well could take a few weeks to come through. Now, Apple School Manager itself isn't available globally. There are several countries where it's not available, but Apple do list them at this KB. So if you've got a multinational deployment, it's something you might want to look at. Even if, for example, uh, you've got folks in, in Jersey, Jersey don't actually have iTunes uh, or, or VPP, et cetera, which is interesting. So just bear that in mind. Just make sure that every territory you're in. Um, the legalities around deploying a device in DEP but shipping it from another country, we're not going to go into. That's, that's your thing. That's your thing. Speak, speak to your lawyers, whatever, your legal team around. But this stuff is going to work globally wherever you are. So, yeah, join the dots. Do what you want. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. So if you've enrolled into either the device enrollment program or volume purchase program after February the 1st, 2014, then you can actually log in and upgrade to Apple School Manager from here. And you might have seen these prompts as well. If you've seen these and you've dismissed them, this is actually something you can do, and the tokens and all the other stuff that you're using to tie into your MDMs now will not, will not be changed. You will not have to worry about any of that. So you can start this process now, and you should have no impact on your current environment. If you've got a really old volume purchase program account that was uh, open pre-February 1st, 2014, then you will have to either set up Apple School Manager separately or you can maybe set up a deploy account first and then bring this one in uh, afterwards. Apple has a great documentation around Apple School Manager, help.apple.com slash school manager. Uh, they have details in here about bringing in these legacy VPP accounts, as they call them. There are also links from there to Apple support stuff. There are 
a gr there's, a, there's a really great uh, Apple support team who can kind of, if you get stuck anywhere, will help you through this whole process. And they really know what they're doing. And so many times you click a button, the button doesn't work, just refer back to them. They know what they're doing. Any fears, everything, go back to Apple. Within Apple School Manager itself, there's three areas we're going to focus. Devices, content, and people. So if you look at the devices first. If you, this is a new deployment, or you're bringing new devices in, or you're a new school, et cetera, a greenfield site that you're, you're bringing in, um, when you buy new devices, make sure you procure them from Apple or an Apple-approved reseller. This will bring your devices straight into Apple School Manager because this person will be, this organization will be DEP registered. If you've got iOS or tvOS um, devices, you can manually enroll them into DEP, and we're going to look at that in a bit as well. So when you do finally get access to Apple School Manager, the first thing you do, you log into it. You can see this screen here. You can ignore this. You can come back to the setup system later on. Um, but you kind of log in, you see some locations. It's weird, it does duplicate. The first one is the one that's created on your enrollment details, and then it shows it twice, but you log in, there's nothing you know, amazing happening here. There is no real details. So if you click on settings and device management settings, this is where you'd start to populate here. And from here, you'd start to add your Apple customer numbers. So if you've uh, been purchasing for Apple, you, you should get them when you speak to Apple around this. If you've been purchasing for your DP reseller, et cetera, then they should be able to supply you with some of these. And if not, again, Apple support, they should be able to advise you on your details. You enter in your customer numbers in here. You enter in your, your reseller ID numbers as well. And that starts the chain of trust. And a lot of this is key around, around trust is. It's very, very simple. But you've now approved that these resellers can add devices to your account. So again, do this now. You will start to get emails. Now, in this instance here, this reseller has tried to add devices to an account, and we actually haven't added them. So the, the, the trust is broken here. So you'll get an email letting you know that, hey, this person's tried to add devices to your account. Um, please approve them. And the reseller is basically saying to Apple, hi, Apple, here's our reseller ID. Here's the customer ID. Here's a list of serial numbers, please assign. So if, if, you haven't, if you haven't put the reseller ID in, you can add it within Apple School Manager within here. And then you receive some emails such as this telling you the devices are available. On the devices currently, at this stage, nothing's going to change. So this is why you can do this stuff in advance. So that's procuring devices. So that's new devices, bringing them in Apple School Manager. What about your old devices? And I'm sorry if I triggered anything with the EMAC in the middle there. Um, now, you can bring older devices into Apple School Manager, not quite as old as them, but anything that's been purchased after March 2011 could be brought into Apple School Manager. I say could. If you've uh, been purchasing through Apple, then they should add them automatically to your account. If you've been buying them through a DP authorized reseller, it's up to them. You try and push them on this. And just as an example, in regards to the device enrollment and the process we're looking at, that needs Mavericks or iOS 7. So if you've, got an, if you've got an iPhone 4S you're trying to give someone, it will enroll if you've got iOS 7. But um, just, I wouldn't do that. Just, yeah. um, again, with all this stuff set up, nothing really kind of happens in here. You might see it's not changed from before. Um, we might look at device assignments and look to assign. And we click on here and we have three actions, assign, unassign, and release. But on the right-hand side, there's a box there for MDM server, which is blank, because we haven't tied it into MDM server yet. But it's still, we're still going to have some details of the systems here to make it available. Now, the three options here, assign to your MDM, unassign from your MDM, it's quite a, which is quite simple stuff. But the, the release is the one to point out here. If someone releases devices from, your, uh, from Apple School Manager, the, they will not be able to be added back again, unless they're iOS and tvOS, you go for provisional DEP. But if they're macOS, then you... Um, you won't be able to add them ever again, and nobody else will. So there's caveats around this. We can look at roles and stuff down the line. But just be mindful with the buttons you're clicking here. Now, to add an MDM, we click on Settings, Device Management Settings, Add MDM Server. Uh, we will need the public key from the um, MDM itself, which will then start that process uh, and start to the MDM server will then communicate with Apple and be authorized to make all these settings as you need. So there's a token there, like I say, and that's your MDM ready to connect. Now, if we go back to device assignments, we'll see that we've actually got the MDM server that we've created available there to assign devices to. But what you tend to do, though, uh, is go to order number, click in the box. It's a really weird thing, but click in the box. You'll have a whole list of different order numbers, and at the top it says all orders. 
and then that should bring all your orders in. Especially, again, if you've uh, an Apple customer, they should bring back all your orders from March 2011, bring them all in and click on all orders, and, um, and then you should be able to bring them in, bring, sign all your devices as needed. From here, you can download a CSV file, then you, you've got load CSV option there in the back, and then assign them to your MDM. So in here, we followed that process. We've now got 411 iPads in the MDM and 76 iPhones. The another nice thing you've got as well is um, the automated device assignments. So you folks might have different MDMs that you're using, one for macOS, one for iOS. You can set this within Apple School Manager so that whenever a reseller automatically adds a device to your organization, it goes to a particular MDM. So you can have one for iPad, except one for Mac OS, et cetera. So this initial faff around bringing the order numbers in, you, can't, you might only have to do that once, and in the future, you just tell it, do you know what, for every new device that comes in, point it here, and then you just don't worry about that going forward. Again, this isn't gonna make any change to the device. So it's procuring devices and bringing them into Apple School Manager, and then pointing them to your MDM. For legacy devices, for iOS and tvOS devices that have been purchased maybe um, not from a DEP registered reseller, you can use Apple Configurator 2 to bring them in, and that's using a thing what's called provisional uh, DEP. For this, it allows you to enroll a device into DEP, and it will sit there for 30 days, acting like it's in DEP, but if anybody unenrolls the device during that period of time, it just goes back to being a normal device. So you want to keep it in 30 days enrolled. Again, this could be a thing. If you folks are looking at rolling out MDM over the summer, grab your iOS devices, grab your tvOS devices, enroll them on the last day of term, and then leave them in a cupboard for the summer holidays. That 30-day period will expire. Those devices will then forever be locked into device enrollment for your organization. So it's up a configurator and bringing your devices into School Manager. Now, what kind of happens here when you do it, you, it's a bit weird. You log into settings again, and you'll see that there's actually a new like MDM server as such called Devices Added by Apple Configurator 2. Apple won't automatically bring them through. They don't quite honor, honor those fancy settings that we had earlier on. But they will add them here, and again, you download the CSV from here, and then you assign to your MDM as needed. So that's procuring devices. Let's use an Apple Configurator to bring devices in. Let's bring them into Apple, um, Apple School Manager, which then points them to your MDM. Now, if we look at content. So within Apple School Manager itself, we can buy apps and books. What's really nice is for education, if you buy more than 20 licenses, you should get a 50% discount. Almost all developers have signed up for this. If you're trying to buy an app and the developer hasn't, bug them. It's a program that Apple are running, but it gives you an auto discount within Apple School Manager itself. The th feature you're going to miss, though, being education, is the fact that you can't do B2B apps, because B2B are business to business. There's no B2B as in business to education. So if you're in an institute and you've got a decision around, do we do Apple Business Manager, Apple School Manager, that could be a consideration as well. You can easily transfer uh, licenses between locations. We'll talk about that a, bit, a little bit later on. And you can also manage iTunes U courses, et cetera. Now, this is one of those things with iTunes U. We haven't gone into any great detail, but there is some great notes around, uh, around iTunes U, how this works, and the impact here within the school manager documentation. So I can only talk about what we dog food, really, but the rest of it, look at documentation. It works. This is another thing that can trip people up when they're bringing in an MDM. They can set up a school manager, but then actually not verify their tax status. This can take up to five working days. And that's only if it goes through smoothly. There can be questions around things. Um, I mean, this is Apple looking at your DUNS numbers, et cetera, all of those types of things. So again, do this now. Do this this school year, uh, this, this, the, the, this uh, year, rather than the next year. Because this can actually hold up any MDM deployment. You don't want to have your MDM ready, but then you can't deploy any content. So just go through this. When you've got it all done, it's quite a simple matter of uh, logging into School Manager again, clicking apps and books. At the top, there's a little search box. Searching here for GarageBand. You might get a load of hits. You can then filter it by device or by, by content. So we've got books there as an option, or we've got iPad or iPhone, et cetera. Select the app you want, choose the amount of uh, uh, licenses you want, and click Get. Now, that's obviously supporting them into Apple School Manager, but they're still not putting them to your MDM. So the MDM, similar to what we had to do earlier in regards to your device enrollment stuff, uh, click on Settings, Apps and Books, Scroll down here, and you've got these tokens that are available for different locations. Now, these tokens are key in regards to MDM, apps and books, 
or what used to be called the Volume Purchase Program. This token, the MDM uses to authorize its, its communication back to the iTunes API to say, hey, we have sold, or we've given away X amount of licenses. And this is a thing where our school manager will reflect those, the, the, those, those licenses being used and the MDM should as well. This token can only be used in one MDM at a time, which is something that people do trip over as well. But it, that, that whole process is broken. It's, it's obviously not a very clever process, but you need to use that token in one system at a time, otherwise you're gonna to start to see uh, calculations wrong. You might try to sign a license to a vice that, that you don't have any licenses. Just keep it to one MDM. So that's bringing your content into Apple School Manager and then bringing that into your MDM server. Now the big, the, the other big thing with Apple School Manager is when you're looking at the accounts that we can create on here. So, First of all, we kind of got like two separate roles as such, or two classes of roles for accounts. We've got your manager accounts, and we've got your user accounts. If you look at the screen, uh, the red and the orange roles are your manager accounts. So administrator, people manager, device manager, content manager. I mean, device and content is stuff that we've spoken about earlier. So you can imagine what areas they manage. Um, and that's kind of more your administrators, the people that, you know, maybe, maybe your team, uh, within your organization, et cetera, are gonna be using those accounts. Apple do have, again, within the school manager documentation, a large matrix of all the different roles, responsibilities, et cetera, that are available. In general, your administrator account that you create um, is gonna have access to everything, and then everything else should in generally be like a subset of. There's one particular area where uh, only administrator accounts can actually uh, access, and it's the terms and conditions. So your terms and conditions are updated every time there's a new iOS version. As of the, uh, like the iOS update last night, there might well be a new terms and conditions for that. Uh, if there's a new Apple School Manager, uh, legal agreements, et cetera, that need to be agreed to, these will happen periodically. Now, only an administrator for your organization can, can agree to these, and you can only have four administrator accounts within your Apple School Manager instance. The reason I'm harping on about this is what then happens if you've not agreed to the terms and conditions, your communication from Apple School Manager to your MDM is effectively broken until you accept those terms and conditions. So if you buy any new apps, they will not appear then within your MDM server. If you buy, have new devices assigned to your account, they will not appear in your MDM server until those terms and conditions are approved. So when you're looking at setting up Apple School Manager, look at the correct roles that you need to do, who's going to be available, who's the person doing this, um, do you want the administrator to be someone who's potentially away for a large period of time or is not available? So it's trying to make sure that you folks have the right people with the right access so you can actually enact stuff without maybe dragging in someone extremely senior just to accept some terms and conditions. And of course, you know, if your organization requires someone with the correct legal responsibility to, to, to accept those conditions, then make sure that you bear that in mind and you can alert them correctly. Once terms and conditions are accepted, the communication will just flow back again. We kind of spoke a little bit about this, but also within Apple School Manager, we have locations. So if you're a single organization, uh, and it's quite a simple one office, uh, one site, you might end up with a one Apple School Manager instance, quite simply with people being administrators, et cetera, managers, being able to manage the, the devices within there. But if you start to become, if you're part of a multi-academy trust or you've got lots of different organizations within your organization, you might find it makes more sense to logistically split this out. So here we've got the township schools, nursery, primary, junior, and secondary, as an example. But you also might not want someone to be managing that across the whole of, Apple, uh, across the, whole of the instance. So instead, you might decide that, hey, I want someone to manage, but I only want them to manage the secondary school. Or I only want them to manage the junior and secondary school. You can actually give people multiple locations that they can have access to. So again, we've got that granular permissions model, and then we can also decide where to assign these people to. So in this instance, this person here, if they had the right rights, would be able to buy content and assign it to the secondary school, and maybe transfer it to the junior school as well. So if you buy 500 licenses and decide, hey, I need 100 to go to junior school, they can do all that within Apple School Manager themselves. But they're not gonna see the other uh, locations available. One of the interesting things with this is though your device purchases, these still go to your root of your instance. So it's just to bear that in mind. So you could have someone accidentally assign devices purchased for one organizational unit to the other one because they've just clicked the button, chose all orders, and just assigned all their serial numbers over to themselves. So if you're going to be building out Apple School Manager in a complex manner, if you've got a large distributed team, 
again, bearing in mind the roles, the workflows, the stuff that you folks will need to put in place. And this kind of makes a bit more sense, though, when you start looking at the other roles that we haven't spoken about yet. We were looking at your student, your in instructor, and your staff roles. It's so been looking at your classroom, your roster data, and bringing all that stuff in. But you can see how you're going to have a junior school teacher a, uh, who, who won't have the same you know, uh, students as senior schools, etc. The other thing as well, depending on, again, how your organisation is structured, if you are a trust who acquires other uh, schools, then what it might be, it might be that actually that you've got separate DUNS numbers and separate, separate legal entities. So you could decide that rather than bring them all in the one upper school manager instance, you could have multiple as well. That has other impacts down the line, but, and, and this is the type of question where you probably want to discuss amongst yourselves, reach out to Apple, figure out where you folks want to do this best. But this is all the really basic foundational stuff that can, can trip people up down the line. And remember, we haven't, we haven't looked at the technical stuff yet, really. This is just to make you, give you folks some readiness. So that's a bit about managers and the users and the different roles that we have there. All of these accounts are managed Apple IDs. Now, what that means as well, managed Apple IDs are education-focused Apple IDs. They've got different sets of terms and conditions and they've got different options. So as an example, they get 200 gigs of iCloud storage, access to various iCloud services, schoolwork, um, institutional password reset. You can reset someone's password within Apple School Manager for their managed Apple ID. You can collaborate using iWork apps across other managed Apple IDs within your organization. And you can also register people for iTunes U courses if you've got them within Apple School Manager. That kind of area that I skipped over earlier on because I don't do it. But this also means there's some limitations here. People cannot purchase through the App Store, Apple Books, iTunes, and Apple Music, which can you know, cause some interesting workflows. If you folks have done your content distribution, your volume purchase program stuff, and you've been giving people an Apple ID to log into a device, and they're signing the license there, <clears throat> that's not a thing anymore. You want to look at doing your device stuff instead. You can deploy apps to a device, no Apple ID needed. Nobody needs to be logged into it themselves. And, and it kind of changes quite a few of those workflows around. Because you can't do any of the uh, go to any stores, there's no reason to have Apple Pay or Wallet access. Things like HomeKit aren't available. Um, there's no iCloud Mail, iCloud Family Sharing, or Keychain. The Keychain's got an asterisk because in, in, one, in shared iPad, you'd use it in another way, but in general, you won't. Um, there's no Find My Mac for my iPhone. Um, you can only enroll into iTunes U courses within your organization. So if your organization, so if you want iTunes use courses outside of that, that can, be a, that can be an issue as well. And FaceTime messages are disabled by default, but you can enable them through Apple School Manager. The access to Find My iPhone and Find My Mac, the reason that's disabled is it's expected that you'll do that through your uh, MDM server, which we only have lost mode for iOS currently, but I mean, we're gonna expect that to come for Mac, I suppose, at some point, if we're gonna have that limited from here. Apple do have a, a, a KB on this as well, which I update frequently with any changes, if they bring in new features. Um, I'm sure there'll be some notes coming up soon around News Plus and what have you, if there is limited with, with, with managed Apple IDs or not. There's also an Apple KB as well around accessing iCloud with these devices. So you can allow that access, allow someone to log into iCloud to see their work they've got saved, etc., uh, and not on a managed device. Now, within Apple School Manager, there's several different ways of populating the user's data. You can imagine if you're a large organization, you're not going to want to add every single student's detail by hand for Apple School Manager or web interface itself. So you can generate a CSV file. Uh, and Apple will give you the template so you can fill those out and then upload them via SFTP. Or if you've got a student information system, a SIS system, then that can also potentially um, send the data to Apple School Manager via the Apple School Manager API. At the same time, though, it might be that your SIS system doesn't support this directly, and there are vendors such as Salamander. Um, Salamander Software, they have uh, a free utility, which we've got a number of our customers using, where they will take data from a SIS system via an API, write out the CSV files that Apple School Manager needs, and then use the SFTP upload. So that's another way of bringing all that data in. So you can populate en masse your data for your students, for your staff, etc. A few things to bear in mind with this, you can't have a managed Apple ID with the same email as a normal ID. So what tends to happen, Apple will prefix or prepend to your email domain, Apple ID dot, because there's a conflict there otherwise. 
And when this is created as well, when you've decided on that, and you can change the, 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 the prepended email bit as well, you then need to also send out the credentials to your end users. And you've got several options here. One is to email them. Hey, your password is, is this. One is to print out a single sheet with the details, and one is to print out a sheet with multiple details. The idea of these last two is if you're doing a brand new deployment and giving people an iPad, give them the iPad, give them the sheet of paper with their managed upload ID details. As you came in earlier, you guys got your passes and stuff, right? So it's the same kind of methodology here. Give them a temporary password, let the students create one, uh, set one up as they go. Again, so this is where we can change those, those details around the managed upload ID, the format that we're going to need. And this was kind of it until Wednesday night, where Apple snuck in a little bit. This, this, this weird week we had last week where things weren't announced, they just kind of happened. Um, Apple brought in federated authentication. Now, what this means, we obviously have another icon now to add to the slide, but federated authentication means that users can leverage their Microsoft Azure AD usernames and passwords as managed upload ID. So if you folks are going as your AD, uh, people will be using their user principal names, whatever username you've got them to use across your um, Office 365 deployment, et cetera. People can now use that to log in instead of their managed upload ID details. You don't need a separate set of credentials. And the authentication is handled by Microsoft Azure AD, and it's just-in-time provisioning for accounts, which means that we don't have to actually have the accounts imported into Apple School Manager. You just get the user to log in with their managed, log into their managed Apple ID using their AD, uh, Azure AD details. That will create the user on Apple School Manager for you. It's quite nice that you can actually just build that out, and you shouldn't have to worry about it too much. Now, it's not single sign-on per se, but there are nuances. So. Uh, if you want to look at the nuances and the options available, speak to you on. Uh, we had a conversation about this on, on, on Twitter. Um, it's, um, and a passcode is still needed in some situations on the device as well. So you've got a passcode policy for Apple School Manager that's still going to need to, need to be followed through. Ad just in time accounts, the accounts that are provisioned, they come in as the role of student. And we saw those different roles as an option. Student, the least privileged role. So if you have got a large organization, you've got staff members logging in, someone will need to go and promote that account once they've created an account in Apple School Manager, then promote that to the relevant role as needed. And if you delete the accounts from Azure ID, then someone needs to go in and manually clean up Apple School Manager. At the moment, there is an automated process there. And lastly, there needs to be some matching criteria across systems. And this is where things get a little bit, a little bit messy with this. So let's look at the matching criteria, et cetera. So you've got uh, your federated services with um, Apple School Manager. You get your sys system uploading to Apple School Manager or via a, CF, a CSV upload, et cetera. And the data for the students or for the managed upload details need to kind of match. So here we've got Johnny at, at townshipschools.org does not match japleseed at townshipschools.org. So they won't be able to match the user credentials here. So this, this is going to be invalid. This isn't something we can use. So instead, we need to alter the details, change the fields, do whatever we need to do to make sure these match. And now suddenly, this person, this managed upload is now going to function. What's interesting here, though, is when you then attach this to your MDM, potentially your MDM is then also going to need access to, um, uh, to, to look up these details as well, and it needs to match them themselves. So your MDM might need access to an on-site domain controller, which is also part of your AD Azure, to then look up the same details and the same matching criteria as what your federated services and SIS need. It, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it gets messy, right? It's uh, all these other considerations to basically look at in regards to this. The deployment might not necessarily be as simple or as smooth as you'd like. Um, so bear that in mind. And obviously, I thought that I was another slide. Uh, so just, but yeah, that is, that is a beautifully complex slide, but potentially that's the, that's the environment you're going to be working in, where you need to make sure your federated services stuff links with your sys imported uh, content, which also links against your AD. So again, this is stuff as well, building up the, the communication there from your MDM into your internal domain. It's stuff where you might need to spin up a, a, a read-only domain controller, you might have to look at your firewall rules. All this stuff can actually hamper your deployment process. So look at this now before you bring on necessarily bring on an MDM. Also with this as well, for the federated authentication, the eligibility review process can take several weeks on the Apple documentation. So actually bringing on Apple School Manager can take six weeks. Then talk about another working week in regards to your VAT status, et cetera, for the apps and books. And then you've got potentially this as well. If you started an Apple School Manager deployment today and went through the enrollment process, there is potential that it would not be completely ready for the next school year. 
because we're, we're not that many weeks away. So, again, look at this now. Look at School Manager. Decide how you're going to integrate it, how you're looking to leverage the services, etc. And start doing this now in advance of anything else. If you, MDM obviously is going to be important, and that's what we need to look at going forward, but you need to get this stuff done. In regards to the federation, it federates whole domains, right? So if your domain is at townshipschools.org and you say, yeah, I don't want to federate this part of the business. Nope, the whole domain is being federated. So that slide where we talked about the different Apple School Manager uh, instances, if you're like an a, a organization that, that brings on other schools, if one of those schools federates your domain, then nobody else can federate. Communication, look at what you're trying to achieve here build out Apple School Manager as you need it. Now, when you are trying to do the federation, there's also some conflicts here. So if you're looking at um, the managed Apple IDs and someone's already using that domain, so the township schools org is already being used as a federated uh, domain, you have to then choose another domain. So the other knock-on effects. So suddenly it's, nope, you can't have this. So again, organization, multiple Apple School Manager instances, potentially you can lock yourselves out and cause quite a bit of difficulty and complication around this. Now, if someone's got a personal Apple ID that contains, that, that, that's registered against an organizational email address, there's another workflow. And we spoke earlier about this, you, there's a conflict. You can't have a managed Apple ID with the same email address. That's kind of the old school way of doing things. If you bring it in with federated services, Apple bring you this workflow in instead. What this all boils down to, uh, Apple identify the users that registered against your organization. So if someone's got an Apple ID, which is at townshipschools.org, as per the examples, um, they will receive an email notification saying, hey, you need to change your username. And if they're not renamed the username in 60 days, Apple will rename it for them and give them a random username. And then that makes the email address available for you to use for managed Apple IDs. So that's a bit inconvenient for, you, for, your, for your staff members maybe, but it's something that you can obviously look at as a process and communicate and let people, get people to, to, to change the details. The difficulty here though, and the thing you need to look at, you, we're federating a whole domain. If you've got an APNS at, VPP at, DEP at, et cetera, service accounts that are going to have mailboxes attached to them, they will fall under this as well. So that could be fun. Yeah, I could see the penny drop a little bit there. <laughs> um, so that might be a moment where you decide to move them to distribution lists, et cetera, remove the mailboxes before you click that federate button because they're going to start to have an impact there as well. Now, Apple School Manager documentation has a lot more detail around this as well. It literally came out on Wednesday, and it's not available in every location yet, the documentation. It's available in the US and en.lproj, whatever. But um, this is new, new, new stuff. I know um, there's, there's someone who's brave. I don't know if you think, maybe not brave, maybe foolhardy, who's already clicked the button to federate their environment. Um, he's had nothing so far back, but yeah. It, I don't know if anybody else is going to be doing the same thing, but literally, he's like, yeah, yeah, button, press button. <laughs> Bless him. Um, okay, so that was basically looking at Apple School Manager around devices, content, and people, bringing them into, uh, in, in, and then bringing them into your Apple School Manager, and then putting them at your MDM server. Then the next part of your journey is from your MDM server into your infrastructure to your devices themselves. I kind of promised I wasn't going to harp on too much about some of these things, but there is a one, like, well, a couple of points we need to make here. So in regards to your network infrastructure, two things are going to be key for any successful modern deployment for your devices. One is your connectivity to Apple and Apple services, and one is content caching. In regards to connectivity, your device is going to need direct connectivity to Apple, no man in the middle proxy and no SSL uh, decryption, no man in the middle, et cetera, just they need to go out. Your device will need to contact Apple on 443, 5223, they'll create a persistent tunnel, which Apple will send the commands down to, and Apple have got KBEs and stuff on this. Also, your MDM vendor will have details around what they require as well. They might have different endpoints. They could be on Amazon, they could be on-prem, et cetera. There's gonna be details around that. The other thing you need to look at in regards to connectivity as well, um, you might be needing to do site surveys and look at your wireless. Have you got enough density for some of these options? If you suddenly got people using 30 iPads in a classroom, and they're putting down gigs of data, but your AP is being shared with three other classrooms, that's probably going to be a bad experience. So you need to bear this, this, this stuff in mind as well. And then, again, looking at your networks and the other things. Do you want to have, uh, you have a different network over staff for students? Build that out so you've got the right connectivity there, the right <coughs> filtering as you need it. And other things to bear in mind as well, things like hidden SSIDs. Um, they're not, there's not really a security benefit there. 
And then actually, they will drain the battery on the device wise. They try and find networks. Some interesting stuff around that as well. And even when you get down to it, you're looking at things such as, in a classroom, you might be looking at 2.4 gigahertz is better for a denser packed environment than five gig, et cetera. That's why you want a wireless survey. Make sure you're getting the most out of your connectivity for your devices. Tom Bridge is doing a wireless workshop on Thursday um, as well. So that's a thing that you can uh, grab a ticket for, purchase a ticket for. So um, I don't know the full details around that, but if that's something that you think you're interested in, then ask Tom or someone at the desk about the workshop. The other thing with this as well is your content caching. So all the content that we can buy through Apple School Manager can be cached locally. This used to be you know, your Apple server, you know, the server app boxes that are sitting there running stuff. Um, and now obviously content cache is available anywhere. Um, we do have some organizations who wanted content, who have got content caching enabled on every device and have a massive weird network with, in regards to that. But you tend to have one device assigned for this that's near your breakout, uh, near your, your internet breakout. And the idea is a device requests the latest version of, say, Word for Mac OS now, or Word for iOS, whatever, um, from the iTunes store. It downloads a copy. And then the next device that requests gets that local copy. So that's going to save you on your internet line. But again, it's not going to save you on your local connectivity, which is why the wireless and the wireless density is still important. Content caching as well uh, will also cache Mac OS and iOS, um, so iOS updates which can be key and can be really helpful for yourselves. Imagine every October, Apple bring out the new major OS release. You're looking at a gig or so, uh, a, an iPhone. If you've got four iPhone models, you're using four gig of your internet bandwidth to service thousands of devices rather than a gig per device that's trying to do the update. And Apple did this great thing with the, with the iOS updates, et cetera, where you know, whatever security features, et cetera, they put in there, people don't really go for, but they put new emojis in and everybody wants to update on day one. So <laughs> be, bear that in mind and make sure your environment's kind of ready for that. So pre-MDM, we kind of have a rough checklist of things that we would say to, uh, for people to do. And if you were a customer coming with us, then these are the kind of th questions that we would ask you as well before we schedule in any work, because this can take, like I say, weeks. In one type of school manager, if you've got any VPP accounts you had previously, add them as well. And again, there's the documentation on Apple's uh, School Manager help page around this. Um, make sure you've got your custom numbers, your DP reseller IDs added to School Manager. Speak to your resellers uh, about adding your legacy, your older devices, the devices purchased since March 2011. Verify your tax information for apps and books. Look at, the, look at the structure of Apple School Manager in regards to the roles and how you're going to roll that out within your institute. And look at the student information system or, uh, and or uh, uh, Azure ID integrations to decide, is that something that you folks want to go to? Is that something that's going to benefit to you? Because those things as well can take time. Just looking to see if this system, this system supports Apple School Manager, then building that integration as well, or a third party tool. Again, that's just going to take time for you folks to figure out and see if that's something you, that's achievable. Once you've got an MDM, there's still some activities to do. We looked at uh, linking your MDM to Apple School Manager for content and linking your MDM to School Manager for devices. You can then add your non-DEP iOS and tvOS devices to, MD to your MDM via Apple Configurator 2, the provisional DEP stuff. So if your MDM rollout is, your, 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 is, is, is going to be for next school year, again, you might want to do that at the end of the school year instead uh, and, and get these devices in and ready. Make sure your connectivity to Apple and MDM is, is in place and look at content caching and see if that's going to be of a benefit to your environment, depending on what other options you have as well. So let's look at devices. So we have kind of gone mostly through the talk, and we haven't actually talked about the device bit, which I know is a bit odd, but hopefully you can see why, because it's quite a foundational thing, and it can really hamper any deployment you're doing if you don't do those very uh, the, those initial things. So things we're not going to talk about, things that are now considered legacy. Netboot, net install, net restore, imaging. Profile management necessarily isn't legacy, but just don't. Um, Non-interactive MDM enrollment. By that I mean deploying a device and it being automatically enrolled into MDM. We've done things before. People want to hide apps, move apps out of the way. We can't have people using Safari. We need to hide it. Those sorts of things. These are things that are not going to be available anymore through the methods. This is stuff we need to move away from. Update servers, uh, no application updates during term time, and directory binding every Mac. So for the first few options, uh, netboot, net install, net restore. Apple, was it server five? something when Apple did a release and basically server app just came down to two services or, or 
So it's a profile manager required stuff, nothing else. Apple do not have a shipping netboot server that they support. They recommend two open source projects, one of which is written by a gentleman who now works for Apple, so that's not being managed anymore. Uh, another one is NetSus, which I'm one of the maintainers of, and literally the only good bit of work I've done in that project is get Duncan McCracken to do all my work. But you now got a, uh, you've now got an option there where you need to boot these devices off removable media, but in a, in a way that's not supported by the iOS vendor, so it's gonna lead you to some difficulty there. Again, imaging. Apple called this out in a couple of articles about monolithic system imaging or something along those lines, but basically block copying on iOS is not supported by Apple anymore. This got more difficult, um, both of these got more difficult with, with recent OS revisions, so Mac OS 10.11, you're looking at your CSI util and booting th net booting things off remote volumes. Um, then 10.13, you had APFS, which they needed the OS to be deployed, and then firmware. You then looked at the T2 chips in all devices, apart from, oddly, the recently released iMacs and the Mac Pro that everyone, nobody wants, nobody's updating. Um, but those devices themselves are, have this kind of personalization and another layer of firmware that needs to be updated as well. You update that to a point, it will not add, take old software. So we need to stop looking at trying to block down and throw down software like that. Non-interactive MDM enrollment, sneaker netting, kind of enrolling devices remotely and just bring them into MDM. MDM is such, so key to managing your devices, you can't do this remotely now. And the other options here we've got available generally through your MDM side of things. Um, and so we do have alternatives here. So if you've got a Mac that comes with an OS, why are you trying to wipe that OS? Use the OS that ships with the device. You can reinstall Mac OS via the recovery, uh, uh, HD, and there's different options around that. Apple have got three different uh, key combinations. One is ship with the latest version that was installed on the Mac, one is ship with the OS that shipped with the Mac, and one is ship with the latest shipping OS. So you have workflows there to make sure your Mac's on a current OS. Also, there's a raise install, which is a, 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 a command line option where you can actually wipe a device and bring it back in, a bit like your um, iOS device, the kind of side of things. You've got over-the-air device enrollment and enforcing that enrollment. So your device enrollment uh, DEP stuff, which we looked at, facilitated through Apple School Manager connected to your MDM. And you basically move into MDM in regards to your settings as well. You want to look at keeping stuff updated, update little and often. When you're looking at VPP, you can't sit there and go, I'm going to sit on this version for the next six months. You either deploy a version and you keep that updated or you don't use VPP, really. So you need to keep that thing going. And there's a term called casual binding. Now, if Joel Rennick doesn't want to be known for uh, Magic Triangle, let's try and get him known for casual binding as a term that he's coined in regards to Nomad, etc. But basically, do your staff machines need to be bound to AD? Look at your infrastructure around this. Are there other ways you can facilitate those people having accounts on their devices without the need for AD? The point of this as well is to give you your sums back. If you update little and often, you don't have to have those mad panic over your summer periods or out of term time where you need to do these on mass upgrades. Do it live, do it daily. And the little bit that you do means that you can be free to enjoy a beach in the summer. Now, one thing to mention here in regards to device enrollment as well, device enrollment happens when a device is activated through the setup assistant. So if you've got Mac OS devices or iOS devices deployed already, you're gonna to wanna to wipe them really to bring them into your device enrollment. Mac OS, you can fudge it a bit, but really wipe your devices to bring them in. Okay, and there's three kind of OSs that we're gonna look at briefly on here um, in regards to this, tvOS, Mac OS, and iOS. Now tvOS is kind of the simplest one. Uh, once you've got everything built in, you just plug in ethernet and power, turn the device on, it will auto advance through. This is gonna be your real zero touch in the end once this goes through. And you can use provisional DEP to bring a device in uh, if it's running uh, iOS, uh, so tvOS 10.2 or more. It's a bit of a faff again to try and bring these devices in because they've got no USB on the modern ones, so you kind of have to have a weird network set up in order for that to be achievable, but it is doable and there's an Apple KB on this. And this is why you kind of do it for tvOS. Imagine you have these tvOS devices, you plug them in, they go straight away into conference room uh, mode. They have your Wi-Fi details pushed down, maybe any, any certificates they need, potentially some custom apps, etc. So you literally out of the box, plug it in, within a minute or two, the device is enrolled and off it goes. Okay, so look at macOS quickly. MacOS, you seem to have two, two different deployment models, your one-to-one -one and your shared devices. Essentially, provisioning these is going to be the same. Device you turn on out the box. It will send its serial number to Apple. Apple will respond back with your device enrollment details for your MDM server. And these steps here that you can customize or not uh, as you need. Now, the important thing here is we're, we're actually logging in and authenticating to this. this is, the only thing that Apple support here is HTTPS basic auth. 
So bear that in mind, there's no SAML option for this page here. But if you look at the security research done by Duo and the folks at Fleetsmith have done this as well, it's very easy for someone to spoof a serial number to then enroll a device into your organization. I mean, we do it as part of like testing and the rest of it. So bear that in mind, and um, it might be worth securing that with those details as well, and look at these workflows and how they're gonna work for you. Now, the trick here though, it's not MDM only, to successfully manage Mac OS, we need to look at MDM Plus. I was trying to figure out a name for this, and then last night, for some reason, it came to me uh, an hour into a live stream. Um, so to successfully manage Mac OS devices, you, you, you need something else, you need another agent. Be if that's uh, a, a version of Monkey running with the MDM you're using, or something like a, a vendor like Jamf, where they've got the agent as well as MDM, but you need a bit more, because currently the MDM spec or the MDM facilities aren't gonna give you what you need to manage your devices. And this is where you can see it here, for example, self-service, these other options. And when you talk about DEP and I talk about zero-touch deployment, when you look at your IBMs, what they kind of did, a lot of these folks did, was they deploy a device with no software. That's how it's quick, that's how people can do it. But then suddenly that becomes a problem if you're looking at labs rather than staff, right? Staff, professors, make the software available maybe, give them the option, that could be fine for what you're doing. But for lab devices, are you then gonna sit there and put some sticky note on the device saying do not touch? Because we all know how that works out, right? Yeah. So this is where you need to look at other workflows around this. Um, so you may be looking at locking the screen out. I don't know if anybody gets the pun with the weight. No? Okay. Um, or maybe a progress screen, which is the type of thing that we're doing. There's also, you've got DP Notify, you've got a Splash Buddy, and at some point we'll make this one available. Uh, yet another progress screen is actually what it's called. Um, but as an example here, you could have device labs provisioned, someone go in, erase the OS, click the button, click the button here, and it's just gonna go through this process, the machine will restart, and then it'll be good to go. It is similar in the end to what you're doing with, with imaging. You image to a point, there'll be some clicking involved, and then you leave it in a state. So we need to kind of revisit that and look at how we're gonna build out those workflows. iOS, we've got three different uh, kind of deployment methods here. One-to-one, -one, shared non-personalized, and shared personalized. The rest of it is very much similar to what we saw in macOS. You go for the setup assistant, we enroll, we bring the device in to your MDM. And again, there's some considerations here around what you're doing. This, you might need a progress screen, you might need to notify people around what's happening, but basically they're gonna log into a device and stuff's gonna change on the devices that, as they're grabbing it. So we've got some apps deployed here via VPP, no Apple ID needed, but there are gonna be, again, changes being made to the device which can be unsettling and you might wanna look at your workflows here. Now, shared personalized is a bit of a weird one a weird term of phrase, but essentially this is using managed Apple IDs. If you've got shared devices, you will, uh, shared iPad, you will enroll your device into DEP, uh, into your MDM, and then you put it into shared iPad mode. If that device is going to be used for six classes that day, you tell to have six accounts on there. And the idea is people will log in with their managed Apple IDs. As they log in with their managed Apple IDs, they will be able to uh, log into the device, they get a personalized device set, set up for themselves, and any of their content, any of their settings are saved back to your content caching servers as well. The last thing with this, all of this stuff, we talked about rosters, we talked about school manager, etc. Then all this stuff then comes through from your MDM, you can then deploy classroom and schoolwork, and then suddenly your educators start to leverage those for teaching in the classroom. And that roster information comes through from your SIS system into Apple School Manager, which then comes into your MDM, and your MDM has the details around the class structure, et cetera, for these apps themselves. So, from all the people that keep looking at me and pointing at their watches, I presume that we have no time for questions, which is good. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to give folks a feel for this. There's, in regards to modern deployment techniques, we can speak to any of your colleagues here, come on Mac Admin Slack, et cetera, around the, the, the workflows around the device enrollment when you get the devices, but there's so much more that you folks need to look at in advance before you start that journey. And so be aware of that. Start that process as soon as you can. Look at the other options you have, and then, and then look, look at your MDM journey from there. So thank you very much. Um, you haven't all fallen asleep yet, so that's good. Uh, and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Got time for one question. Right, okay. One question. Anyone going to be brave enough? <laughs> um, oh. 
said if you remove a device from Apple School Manager, you can't re-add it. If you release a macOS device from Apple School Manager, Apple Business Manager, or device enrollment, then you cannot add it back in, and Apple cannot add the device back in. So and if you were giving it to a the member of staff, or you were recycling it or giving it to a charity, it's a great idea. Release the device, it's done. Yeah. You can unassign it from an MDM, which means it doesn't necessarily follow through your, your DP workflow, and then you can assign it somewhere else. If it's tvOS and iOS device, you can go through the configurator workflow and bring it in that way, even if it's been released. Could the original supplier of that device not even re-add it? Well, if Apple can't do it, then the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the reseller's not going to be able to do that either. Yeah. Um, I've never, to be fair though, I don't know if anybody else has, has had a device release that they've brought back in. We've just been advised, and there's a quite a lot of text around, do not release unless you really, really, really need to. If you go and release, it tells you, do not release unless you really, really, really need to. Um, there's quite a few red warning sign buttons and flashy lights that happen when you try and do that. But I don't know if anybody here actually released the device and gone through a process with Apple to maybe bring the device back in. I don't even know if it's feasible. I just know that all the red flashy lights, I think it's not, but... Yanis? It's not um, officially that that cannot happen, but I know of uh, a case where the Apple resold the device to them. So, so yeah. um, officially it can't happen, um, and, um, but the gentleman who didn't have a mic in front of him might have another opinion around that, so we'll just you talk about that right. with them. <laughs> But potentially, as with all of this, check with Apple again. If anybody can bend the strict rules that are laid down here, it's the people who made the rules. Yeah. So. Good. Nice.